Okay, good. Okay, good. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Great presentation before mine. So this session is about uh, data modeling. So we're going to discuss about uh, why data modeling is important in uh, Power BI. So the idea of the session is to not have any prerequisite. So if you already know, you know, uh, data modeling uh, in uh, Kimball methodology, star schemas, uh, dimensional stack tables, probably this session is not for you. But if these terms are new to you or you wanted to understand uh, what uh, they mean and uh, why they are so important in Power BI, that's the right session for you. So. Let's go straight to just a very quick introduction about myself. I write books about DAX, data modeling, and you can find a lot of free content also on sqlbi.com. And if you want to download the slides and the demos that I would use in this presentation, you can see here the QR code and also the URL where you can download that. I will show you this slide also at the end, so don't worry. And the agenda is about uh, what are the topics we're going to discuss. Uh, we're talking about uh, we're going to talk about um, the granularity of the data that you have. Uh, why is not a good idea to import data in a single file without doing any you know cleaning of the data? And uh, what are the problems and why we need to structure data in a certain way? And also what are the common errors we the common mistakes that you should try to avoid when you create your data models in Power BI. So let's start with uh, the first uh, um, topic, the first introduction, which is uh, why working with a single table is a bad idea, usually. And uh, in order to show you the problem, I like to start uh, with Excel. If I go to this uh, model, I, I imported here a table in Excel. And this table in Excel is uh, a big table. And it's a very common way to work when you have Excel. So basically, you import data that you have uh, in a single table where you have uh, certain columns like a sales amount, total cost, uh, that tells you which is the amount of sales and the cost of those sales uh, for a particular product, particular brand, particular date. So what you are getting is a, is, a, is a table where data has been already aggregated at a certain granularity which means that we obtain this data usually because we sent a query to um, we sent a query to a database by SQL Server, Oracle, Access, something like that. And uh, the result of this query has been imported into Excel where you can create a chart, uh, a pivot table, and you can navigate. But when you extract the data, you define what we say with the granularity, the detail that you have in the table. And if you think about this, the granularity of the table has an effect on the side of the table itself. So for example, if you look at this table, we have uh, the granularity is uh, date, manufacturer, brand, uh, subcategory, category. We don't have the product name here. We just have the, the, the category and the manufacturer of the products. And so you can imagine that these uh, 55 number as the quantity for a particular day is made by aggregating different products. Now, if I look at the size of this table, if I scroll down, we have 63,000 rows. And what happens if I add more information, more details, if I add the, the, the product name column here, the number of rows are gonna increase. So the, the volume of the data that I have is going to increase the more details I want to include. And this is the concept of the granularity that I introduced. When you work with Excel, usually we tend to, to get um, data that has been already aggregated at a certain granularity because we have a limitation. We can only import 1 million rows in a single table in Excel. And not only that, if you have even just a hundred thousands of rows, performance is going to be bad and the file size is huge. So let's say that this is a limitation that oh, in, some way, in some way already affects the decision we make uh, about uh, the, the data model. 
But more than that, defining this limitation, defining this detail has an effect on the kind of analysis we want to do. For example, what happens if I want to analyze the data by color? The color was not here. So if I have to do the analysis by color, I have to repeat the extraction of the data again. Uh, potentially, I increase the number of rows. And at a certain point, if I add too many attributes, uh, I'm going uh, I'm gonna to have a problem with the memory, or in, in the case of Excel, just the, the number of rows I have in my, in my table. So a high granularity means that we have a bigger detail, a, a bigger number of information, a bigger number of rows, uh, more detail, more analytical capabilities, but we need more memory, more uh, uh, capacity in our system. A lower granularity means a lower number of rows, but at the same time, uh, this lower number of rows uh, reduces the analytical capability because we reduce the, the number of uh, columns, the attributes we, want, we, we can analyze. And so the idea is if I have only one, one attribute, the category, and one column sales, I have uh, um, low granularity and uh, a small table. If I add the, the subcategory, we have to increase the number of rows in order to provide the information about the details we want to, we want to use. So now, one good thing about uh, Power BI, it doesn't have the limitation we have in Excel. We are not limited to get only one million of rows. Indeed, I have a Power BI file here, which has the same information, so the model here has a single table, a single huge table with a lot of columns and a lot of rows. How many rows? If I go here, you see in this uh, small corner here, this table has 12 million rows. And uh, why it works? Because uh, Power BI compresses data. And so when you see the same value in a column, the, the, the storage, the amount of memory consumed by this column is smaller because the column is compressed. And you see we have uh, several columns are blank because we don't have a customer name for many transactions. But if I, if I scroll down, at a certain point, I, I should see that uh, some of these uh, rows have a name, uh, have an education. But again, how many unique strings I have for education? Just a few. And because of the data compression, I don't have to pay a big price for that, which is very good. But now, what happens if I start to analyze my data? I mean, it is just a problem of memory, not at all. I mean, at the beginning, having a single table like that uh, with all the data fully denormalized, I will explain this term later, but uh, this is what you get if you get a lot of tables together in a query builder or in Power Query, you expand all the columns that you have with all the other tables that you can reach and you get this huge table. It works, but we have some limitation in the analysis we can do. For example, let's take a look at uh, what we have here. We have a product category name, we have the color name, we have the sum of sales amount. As long as you just group by one of the columns we have and you just sum something, that's fine. But uh, what is the problem if we included in the data model some information that doesn't have the granularity of uh, the data that we see here? Let me explain what I mean. If you look at this uh, model here, the table we have here, we have a column here that's called early income. And the early income is an information that is related to the to the customer. But now, if you think about this, uh, this column is uh, duplicated across uh, the rows. So if I sort, for example, if I sort by last name, right, just to see what happens, you can figure out that, uh, come on, if I have uh, the, a, a certain customer name here, let me see if I found one. Come on, maybe at the beginning. Here we go. Okay, so where is I need one with the A. Come on. Okay, here we go. So you see that uh, this, uh, oh, let me just go back here. I went to the right column, to the wrong column. I don't see the, the customer name. Maybe I didn't sort uh, the, by name. Let's 
range. Let me remove uh, the blank from the from the list, so it should be easier. Okay. So here I probably have like this Jenna Adams. We have several rows here that belong to the same customer, but now these eight, these eighty thousand thousand of uh, yearly income are real income of one customer, but is duplicated across uh, multiple customers. So if you think for a moment about the problem, what should they want to do with the yearly income is not just a sum. I, I want to do an average. And what happens if I just uh, bring uh, this uh, column, the yearly income in the table here, and I try to see the yearly income by for example, color name. Okay, you, you may say, Marco, it doesn't make sense by color name. Okay, that's no problem. Let's remove the color name. And let's include the, the country, if I have the country, or the city, or, what, or the education. The education is a, is, a good, uh, is a good attribute because the education is an attribute of the, um, of the customer. Now, the daily income that I put here has a default uh, aggregation, which is by um, sum, by summing the, the, the value but I can change this to an average. And I see a number that, is, that look reasonable. But if you think about, the, about the, what, the, what is the meaning of the number we see here, well, this number is dividing uh, the sum of the yearly income by the number of transactions. So if one customer has many transactions, his value is counted multiple times, but we actually have that value only for one customer. So the problem is that sometime we have a problem in getting the right numbers when we want to do this analysis. I have another example for that, which is the, the file number three, where we have something similar. We have the yearly income by brand name. And if you look at these numbers, it seems that we have a lot of people that are very wealthy. But actually what we have is a single customer who has 10 million as a, as a um, yearly income, which is not a real customer, it's a company. And the problem is that uh, because this company has a lot of transactions, now it seems that I have only millionaires that are my customers, which is not true. And uh, this is not what I want to do. And so we have a problem in uh, getting the right numbers out of this model. So what I'm going to say is that uh, the, the right data model is something that solves a problem of calculation that otherwise we will not be we will not be able to obtain by just looking at the data this way. So how, what should we do in order to, to solve the problem? So what we have to do, so this is the problem we have. We have scattered information. We have uh, um, having a single table, have a very high granularity that duplicates the data across all the rows could be a bad idea if what we duplicate are measures, are numbers that we want to manipulate. And uh, the yearly income is just an example I, I, I wanted to show you. And uh, we want to consider a better data model. W what is a better data model? Well, in my table, I mixed two different business entities. I mixed the information about the transactions of the sales, and I mixed the information about the customers. But these are two different business entities, and they should be two different tables. I should have two tables in the model regardless of my data source. This is important. It doesn't matter how many tables I have in my data source. My model for the business analysis should have two tables because I have two business entities. I have the transactions of the sales, I have the customers. These are my business entities. And if I create a model with two tables, what I get is this other example, where we have uh, this model, where we have two tables. Here we go. We have customer and we have sales. So sales uh, contains only the information, the attributes about uh, the transactions. We, we made uh, selling uh, goods, selling products. We have the date, we have the product name, we have the quantity, we have the price but we have a single information that identify the customer, which is this customer key, the customer code, the customer name. Actually, it should be an information that uniquely identify the customer. So probably you have a customer code in your original data source. And what we do, we create a single table customer that has one row for every customer. This way, we know that uh, we just have one row for every customer in the model, 
Not because we want to save space. This is not the goal. We already saved space in the previous model. The previous model was compressing customers that had the same name. But in this case, the difference is that my model knows that if the yearly income is an attribute of the customer table, it means that that information, that numbers, is related to one customer. Then, of course, it could be propagated to the transactions. But actually, when I want to do the average of the, uh, of the yearly income by customer, I just do an average here, which is actually what I can obtain in this report. So if I, um, let's consider, let's ignore this for a moment. If I create a table here and I include, like I did before, the um, education of the customer here, and uh, let me just increase the size of this so we can see this better. And uh, we can just uh, go here. And uh, for each education, I include the yield income and I'm not writing any of that code now. I'm just saying, okay, I want to do here the average of uh, this yearly income. So I go here and I select the average. Here is, here is the right number. I just need to format it maybe in a better way. Let me go here and uh, uh, let's go here. And I don't remember how every time I have to, they move the things around every time. How can I do this? Anyway, so uh, that's a funny. I, okay, let's go here. And let's set the format here in the yearly income in the customer table. I just wanted to, because uh, otherwise, uh, when, I, when I don't have the, for, the right format, it's sometimes misleading to look at the numbers. So you see that actually we don't need to get the decimal numbers. This is what I, what I wanted to do. So you see here that 10 million is just for one customer, which is the customer we don't have. But actually now you see that these numbers are the right numbers because we consider every customer only once. Okay, this is the important thing. Now, because we have two tables and because we have a relationship between those, these two tables, we can safely group the data by customer and we can uh, analyze data about sales, like the quantity. So you see that in this uh, chart, uh, what we have is again, just the quantity column. So I'm not writing DAX now, I'm just uh, writing uh, regular aggregation and I'm summing the quantity and I can group the quantity by customer education, customer continent, uh, and uh, it doesn't take any effort. So my effort was I have to create the right data model up front uh, using the right methodology to find uh, the right number of tables and the right relationship between these tables. So what is the right, and at this point you may say, okay, but so how many tables I have to create? Well, the business uh, rule for that is that uh, we have to identify the business entities and we have to create one table for each business entity. So the rule is one entity, one table. So at this point, uh, the problem is, okay, what is one entity? Um, the product are an ent a business entity. Uh, the customers are a business entity. The countries are not. I mean, in my model, I'm a company that, uh, imagine I'm, I'm writing a system for a company that is selling goods around the world. Um, the country is an attribute of the customer or is an attribute of the store. Of course, there are cases where the country is an entity by itself and Unfortunately, in these days, uh, this is a very common situation. We want to analyze the data about uh, the virus outbreak uh, by country. At that point, the country is a business entity because in, this kind of, in that kind of analysis, uh, we have the data that is related to the country. So the country is the business entity when we consider the, the virus uh, outbreak. But uh, in... Uh, a system that analyzes sales uh, of products, uh, usually the customer uh, is related to the, is an attribute of an existing business entity. Okay, so it's very different. And so the same information could be part of a business entity or it could be an attribute of another business entity depending on the analysis that you do, which means that the very same uh, data model as a data source could be used to generate attributes of existing entities or Autonom autonomous business entities, depending on the analysis. We should build the data model based on the analysis that we do, not based on the, how we get data from the data source. The worst thing you can do, you access to a relational database, a relational database that is used to you know, manage a, um, you know, 
an accounting system and import the data as is, all the tables in without any transformation, bad idea. You end up having a lot of tables, a lot of uh, relationships, uh, and uh, this, uh, I'm not saying that this is impossible to manage in Power BI, you are just uh, creating a system that is more difficult to use. Whereas if you follow this simple principle, you end up having a simpler system to, to manage your data and to explore your data, navigate your data. So at this point, I can introduce you to a topic that is uh, how we call these tables in a, in a model that is designed to do analysis. And uh, the name that you see in this slide are names that come from uh, something that you probably heard about, which is the Kimball methodology or the Kimball dimensional modeling. And the idea is that uh, in these databases that are designed for uh, business intelligence, business analytics, use the name that you want, but the idea is that the design, the, the, the data model is optimized to do business analysis, to do reporting, to do aggregations. And uh, the tables that we import that are always related to business entities have a different name depending on the content and on the role they have in our model. We split these names in two kind of tables. We have fact tables we have dimension tables. These are the two names that we use. Why we have these two names? Well, because when we have a, a system that analyzes data, we usually have uh, to distinguish between two different types of business entities. We have business entities that represent events, that represent something that happened over time. And we call the tables containing these events fact tables. For example, a transaction online. Uh, one click on a website is an event which should, should be stored in a fact table. One order I received from a customer, one shipment. These are events. These are transactions that we should store in a fact table. But a table that describes what happened in, a, in an event is a table that we call a dimension table. And a dimension table is usually a table that contains all the attributes of a single business entity. For example, we sell goods, but uh, what we are selling, products. Who is buying our products? Customers. When did we sell our products? Uh, dates. The date is a table, which is a dimension. So uh, where did we sold this product? In a store okay. or maybe online. Who shipped this product? Uh, the, the shipment company, for example. So every business entity has a table. Every dimension has all the attributes describing that business entity. So if I have a table customer, I expect this table customer to have the customer name, the customer, uh, the company name, the address, the city, the country, the state, the continent, the education, everything is there and not scattered in many other tables. We have one table customer, not 10 table customers for the customer. So the fact table is usually the table that has the largest number of, trans the largest number of rows and usually not too many columns. And uh, it, the large number means that we could have billions of rows. Now, actually in Power BI, I expect to have a table, a fact table in Power BI, 10, 20, 100 million rows uh, is manageable in Power BI Desktop. Um, if you have Power BI Premium, uh, maybe you can uh, move up to billions of rows, like in analysis services, uh, but, um, if you have a very, very large system, not analysis service, but you know, data warehouses uh, like uh, uh, SQL Server Data Warehouse uh, or other system, you can have uh, hundreds of billions of rows. And uh, Power BI is very good in uh, getting this data, aggregating this data and providing you know, results in a, in a matter of a few milliseconds usually. And what we store here, usually numbers, quantity, price, uh, amount, uh, cost, uh, 
the information we want to aggregate, usually with a sum, sometimes with an average, but usually with a sum. And uh, there are, of course, information that we usually use only to connect the fact table to the dimensions. The, the, the customer has to be identified with a customer key, a customer code, same for the product, same for the date. We have only the column date, the day, but uh, the information about uh, what is the month, uh, what is the quarter, what is the period, is it summer, is it a working day, is it Sunday, all these informations are stored in a, ta in a date table, okay? And the date table is a dimension. So the dimension usually is a small table. Now, small is a relative concept uh, because uh, it, we certainly have a smaller number of rows in a dimension compared to a fact table. So we usually have uh, a few thousand rows in a date table, um, 10,000, 100,000 rows in a product table. Sometimes the product table is big. We have a few million rows, but I do not expect having billions of uh, products or billions of customers, right? And uh, of course, sometimes it happens, imagine a bank uh, could have uh, 10 million customers. Uh, okay, the, in these cases, we have a large dimension, which could have, could generate some issue in performance for the query. Um, for Power BI, we consider a large dimension, what, uh, you know, go over 1 million of uh, uh, rows. Uh, you could see some slow, slower uh, problem, perform some performance issue when you start approaching a few hundred thousand of products or customer. But let's say that we consider the threshold of one million is usually what we consider a large dimension. And we try to stay below that number when we can, even though we know that at some time we have to store millions of products. And we, we, we will manage the, the, the performance issue related to that. Now, uh, once we have uh, this table that has uh, a smaller number of rows, however, we usually have a lot of columns. It's normal having many columns in a dimension, and it is usually better having a table, a dimension, imagine customer with uh, maybe 100 columns rather than having uh, five or six tables that represent the customer because a few information like uh, the city, the state are stored in other tables is not a good idea having a table with a customer that has the city and then the city uh, the, the, the state of the city the country of the city is another table bad idea don't don't do that um, we usually tend to prepare the data and having this data but i will talk about this later so how we how do we define a dimension the dimension has to be defined uh, locating the granularity of the dimension so for example, if uh, we are storing customers, we have one row for each customer, and we need one column that contains a unique identifier for that uh, entity. For example, the product uh, key or the customer code. This column is uh, unique and has only one unique value for each row of the table. We use that, we use that code in the fact table to relate the dimension. This is the way we design these tables. Um, other attributes of the customer table or of the product table are what we call at additional attributes that are not business entities, are just description of this, of this business entity. So as I said before, country is not a business entity unless you want to analyze uh, uh, information about the population or the number of people that uh, uh, got the virus or something like that. So demographic data may be are the exception to the rule, but uh, you are doing a business where the country is actually a business entity and not the opposite. So once we define fact table and dimensions, how do we connect them? The connection is made using uh, these keys that uh, identify the business entity. So we said in every dimension, we have a unique identifier of the product of the customer and so on. And uh, the same information is present in the fact table and then we created this connection. Now, what we get as a result is a layout that is similar to what you see in this slide. We call this layout a star schema. In a star schema, we have the fact table is something we put in the middle and we put all the dimensions around with a single relationship connecting the fact table to the dimension. And if you look at the layout, it's similar to a star um, where we have many, you know, 
many different uh, spikes and around. Um, and uh, this is what we expect to have. As I said, is usually not a good idea having relationships between dimensions or between fact tables, even though we might have multiple star schemas in the same model, which means that we could have one table sales for the fact, uh, sorry, one fact table sales and one fact table uh, uh, purchases. And these two different fact tables could share the same dimensions. This is absolutely fine. But when you look at a single fact table, what you should see is this star schema. If you see something different, you might have some problem. Now, Power BI, and in general, every business intelligence tool, also if you consider products of other vendors, when you have a star schema, life is easy because these tools are very well optimized for this kind of uh, model. You have, if you have something different, I'm not saying that you cannot work, but you are making your life more difficult for no reasons. You can usually always project your data into a star schema. And there are a lot of articles describing this. We are not talking about something new. These ideas, these concepts uh, have been out uh, there for 40, 50 years, for zero. Okay, there are a lot of books about this. So just uh, look around the dimensional modeling star schema. You will find a lot of content. So it's just a question of uh, maybe you will not find the, the, the book for uh, Power BI, even though the, we, we wrote a book about that. But I'm just saying this is a very easy content to find. If you want to go deeper in the description of what are these concepts, it's easy. Now, what happens? If I create my star schema, so we have, we said, just to recap, we have the fact in the, the fact table in the middle and all the dimensions around. So when we have this, so let me open my other example here. I have this example number five. And you see that in my model, the original table that had everything in a single table now has the same information, but Sales has all the rows of the original table, but just a few columns. You can see the, the result here. This is sales. The new sales table is smaller because we have only one column for the store, one column for the product, one column for the date. And then we have uh, information about quantity, unit price, discount. That's it. Then where are all the descriptions about the customer? In the customer table. The customer table has all the information of the customer. The product table has all the information about the product and so on. So we, we, we have this way, the ability to navigate in our model. And by the way, you obtain another good side effect. Because Power BI shows uh, these uh, fields grouped by table, if one table is a business entity, is also intuitive to navigate into the data. Because, oh, if I want something about the customer, it's here. If you want something about the product, it's here. It's easy to find the information that you want to use to group data. And uh, when you apply a column in the report, you automatically group the data by uh, that attribute because uh, the propagation of the, real, of the filter uh, works very well, is very fast, and the, the, the numbers that you get are correct and consistent. Okay, This is the reason why we use the star schema. So um, let's go back to the slide one second. Uh, what is here? Why should we use the star schema? So I mean, I, I said that uh, the, the, it would be possible to solve the problems in other ways. But first, you have to write more DAX code. And, and I teach DAX, OK? I'm teaching DAX, so it's, it could be good for my business. But actually, you don't have to write DAX if you don't need to. So let's try to. Write DAX when you actually need it. But if you can solve a problem in an easier way, why not? And uh, the complexity that you should involve in the DAX code required when you don't have a clean uh, model makes a performance an issue. So uh, you want a good performance and simple DAX, create a star schema. That's the first simple rule you have to follow. Now, the Designing a good data model could be not an easy task. As I said, that this, uh, is, this is not a really new concept. But uh, because it is not new, we have a lot of uh, articles, books written about this topic. So if you say, no, my problem is different, uh, 
I have something that uh, is not possible to be described in a star schema. Well, think it twice, maybe more than, than two times, because uh, probably someone already had this problem before you. And there is a description of how to model the problem in a star schema. Believe me, believe me, it's very hard to find something that cannot be described in this system. Of course, this requires data preparation. I know that, but, uh, but uh, it's something we can do. And in order to explain what is the challenge of creating a star schema, I have a very common example that I want to show you. Because, uh, of course, we could talk about this for hours. I only have other 25 minutes. So I have a couple of examples I want to show you. And one is very, very common and popular which is uh, my data source has a data that is not structured in a star schema way, but it looks good enough. And uh, it seems that I can import this data in Power BI and it just works. Well, it's not really true. You might have some problem you didn't think initially. And uh, this is an example that is very common. Imagine you have a system that has a sales, and the sales are described with a, a sort of uh, order details uh, uh, structure. So you have, uh, for each uh, invoice, you have uh, a row in a table that we call sales header, where you have the information that are common to the entire invoice. Because uh, we create an invoice for a customer in one date in one store. But in this invoice, there is a list of products that have been part of that transaction. So it's very common for the ERP systems that manage this to basically create two tables, one for the header of the invoice, so one row for each invoice, and then you have another table that has one row for each line of the invoice. It's very common. And this also solves a problem because uh, it allows to avoid duplicating the information of the invoice header in the lines of the invoice table. This also guarantees consistency of the data in the data model. <clears throat> now, this is very important if you have uh, to build an ERP system. Consistency of the data has to be guaranteed in the data model. But guess what? When we do data, anal data analytics, when we, do, when we do business intelligence, um, it is not our job to guarantee data consistency because we are extracting data from another system. And if something is wrong in the system, we cannot fix it. So our goal is not to, to make it sure that the data is consistent. We have to assume that data is consistent in our data source, but we can transform the data also accepting some data duplication if this doesn't affect the core result. We know that we could have different uh, customers for the same invoice in different rows of the details if we started to denormalize. But remember what we did at the beginning with Excel. We can simply say, okay, we can denormalize everything, and it just worked. Um, but uh, the problem could be sides, but we have a data compression, and granularity. Now, the granularity here is not an issue, because if you think about this model, the fact table that says header is here, only to transfer the filter from the store, from the customer, from the data to the fact table. And so even though you may think, okay, what is the problem here? It just works. If you try this model, it just works. However, even just if, if you consider just the performance, this relationship is a very bad idea for the performance because usually you connect two large tables together without a reason to do that. We could have one dimension that is large, but this, the presence of this relationship increases the cost of transferring any filter from any other dimension. Also, if it is a small one, you will pay the big price of this huge relationship, so performance. But the other reason is that we actually could create a problem in the numbers. So let's take a look at the um, number we have in this case. We have, uh, I had this model here, so let me open the number six, where we have, uh, this uh, model, the same model you have seen in the slide. And uh, you see that we have here a column that is called total discount. What is the discount? Let's, let's take a look. If, uh, if you look at this uh, table, this table is grouping the discount value by continent and calendar year. Now, if you look at the model, 
the continent is an attribute of, uh, I think, the customer. Let me check. Uh, yes, oh, sorry, the store. So we're looking at the stores, the continent of the store, and we're looking at the year of the sale that is an attribute of the date table. Now, date and store are two tables that are connected to the sales header, and the sales header has the total discount column. This number is, is correct because we're looking at the star schema. But uh, what happens if I include, because you know, the sales detail has information about uh, the quantity, the product. Uh, so if I create another table here, so let me duplicate this. I create a, here a table where I include, uh, instead of the store continent, I include the product uh, class, for example. So you see that uh, now, let me remove the, the calendar here for a second. Uh, the discount, sorry, the discount value is wrong. I have to use something from the sales detail. So if I use from the sales detail, uh, the quantity column, the number is good. And if I use the year from uh, the date table, so if I go here and I get the year on the date table here, maybe in the columns, the number is still good. I mean, I'm splitting the quantity by class of the product and year that I have in my data table. And you see that I'm splitting the number. I see the numbers that are different. But now what happens if in this report, I want to see the discount amount? So if I get my discount amount or discount value, the discount value, the total discount value that I include here is always the same number. What is happening here? I'm trying to split the discount by an attribute that belongs to the product. Now, if I go here, product is here and class is here. I could use the color. Now, product can filter sales details, but sales detail cannot filter sales header. And you may say, Marco, you can enable the bidirectional filter. It's a bad idea. It's a bad idea because uh, we don't know. We don't know if this number will be correct. Let me show you. You see that now the number is different. But believe me, if you sum these numbers, the sum of these three numbers is bigger than 395. Guess what? Do, 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 do the math. You do this number plus this number plus this number. The total is something uh, close to 500,000. It's certainly more than 400,000. It's easy to, to see the it's 430,000, something like that. Why? Because uh, we are summing the same number multiple times. If I have a class of products, I'm getting all transactions of those products and the sales header of those products. But the same sales header, the same discount, the same information in one order could belong to different lines that belong to different products in different classes. So I'm duplicating the same discount multiple times. The total, of course, does not show that because this total is, com is, com is computed by doing a single sum without, having a, without, summing, the same, uh, without summing the three classes. Which, this number is correct. If you remove the class, this number is what you expect, the sum of the discount without any filter. And it's the same number we have here. And we know this number is correct. So this is the problem. And uh, the bidirectional filter is not the way to go because it would introduce um, numbers, calculation that are not additive, which is not what we want to do. This is another example. You see here, if I do the same example that I've shown you and I use the brand here, the numbers that you see seems correct. But if you do the math, the total, the total is 458,000, whereas the, the, the right number should be 395,000. So we have a problem in the numbers. Now, I don't know you, but uh, a report that doesn't work makes people angry. A report that provides the wrong numbers could fire you. Because it's, it's the entire reason why we do business strategy is to get good numbers. And, and then we think about the performance, okay? So let's, uh, what, what, what should we do at this point, okay? So we could, um, I'm sorry, there is some, uh, someone who has the Microsoft open. Not sure about, uh, I hear voices. Okay. Um, 
what we have to do is we have to solve the problem how. Well, the right thing to do is think about the problem. Um, we cannot apply the discount. If, if, if for some reason we have a discount at the header level of the model, we cannot uh, use that number. We should allocate this number row by row. And how can we do that? Now, first of all, we have to agree with the business uh, um, users what is the right thing to do. And for example, one solution we found in this case is that, okay, we could compute the percentage of the discount compared to the total of the order, and then we apply this percentage to all the rows of the order, all, all the line of the, of the order, so that we allocated the total discount for each row based on the cost, on the revenues of that order. And uh, if I do that, and I create this column, so let me show you how we solve the problem here. So we have this total discount here. We could create here, um, calculated the column that computes the, the, the value that you have seen in the slide. Let me just copy because I don't want to go out of time. So I'm just copying uh, the formula here. So I we use uh, the discount the percentage uh, using this formula. So you see here the number we get, uh, and just to show you is a uh, 20%. So the, depending on the on the on the order, we have a, a discount applied. Then at this point, I can go back to my sales detail table, and I could create a column here that says, okay, I can. Uh, uh, I can compute the discount. The discount is equal to related uh, header discount uh, percentage. So I think it's this one. And I multiply this number by, for example, the, uh, the net price. Okay. I have my discount value. Okay. Now I can sum this discount value. So if I go here, and I get the discount value that I obtained this way in the promotion, I have, uh, uh, let me just see, there is something I did not correct here. Uh, this is the net price, so let me see if this is correct. Okay. So, oh, sorry, I got that from the promotion. I made a mistake, so I have to go. There is, uh, detail and uh, I can use this discount. This is the right number. And you see that there is a, a, a certain difference. Of course, we, we are getting a smaller number probably because I, I had to check the, the formula I used. Oh yes, because we have to multiply this by the quantity. That's a good point. And, uh, and uh, so let me just uh, go back here. Uh, one second only. I have to go here and I have to multiply this by the quantity. And I go back here and now you see that this number is still not correct. So that's fine. I'll, uh, let me check. Uh, let me check. Uh, <laughs> I'm forgetting something because I'm, I'm rushing a little bit, but I can show you the calculation I prepared somewhere else. Uh, Check so total discount. Da, 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 da. So unit price. Oh, unit price. Sorry. Oh, I, I used the wrong uh, because I used the net price. I used the unit price to do the calculation of the discount. So I have to apply this to the unit price, not to the net price. That's the reason. Now I should see the number here is the same, but when I apply now my, for example, product uh, color or product uh, class like I did before. You finally see that this is the right number. If you sum these three numbers, you get the right result. This is the wrong number. So if you think about how I solve the problem now, I no longer need this table sales header. So the right thing to do would be having here a structure where instead of having these three relationships, so let me delete this one, delete this one, and delete this one. And of course, what I'm doing, I'm doing the transformation in DAX, but actually a better way to do this would have been using Power Query. 
I'm not doing that just because the time for the demo will be longer, will take longer, and uh, it's not our goal to, to do that the transformation because uh, we, I also want to show you another example. But uh, uh, so just using uh, this approach, I can create here another column like uh, the date is equal to related of order date key, for example. Then I create another column with uh, the, pro, the, the customer key is equal to related the customer key. And I do the same for the product. Product key is equal to related of product. Again, remember, this is uh, not the best, uh, uh, sorry. This, I'm not saying that this, no, sorry, not for the store, 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 store key. I was wondering why I had this. Uh, yes, the store key here. Come on. Okay. Okay. Now that I have these three columns, and this is called date key two, I can connect my tables. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because at the end, what I get is a, a simple star schema. And when I have a star schema, so I have this, I have the date key, and I have the store key. Here we go. Store key, here we go. Now that I have my star schema back, I know that any kind of calculation I do will work and I don't have to use any DAX code for my measures. Or the DAX code I need is just a sum, it's something simple. So the star schema is the right way to go for this kind of problems. So as the second and uh, the second example for today is what uh, should we do if we have multiple fact tables? If we have multiple tables actually that contains transactions. And once again, I, I start with um, you know wrong data model. So in this case, uh, and I open uh, the last example, we have uh, two fact tables that are that have just purchases and sales. And what is, what is the problem of these two tables? These two tables are like our initial example, but this time we have uh, two tables that have all the attributes uh, fully denormalized. Well, we have the complete description of purchases with all the columns. So imagine having these two tables in Excel. These are the purchases by product, subcategory, brand, date, and so on. And we have another table with the sales uh, the same attributes, but in this case, the meaning of the price and quantity is sales. If I create uh, a table that has the brand name used uh, using the brand name for the, from the purchases, uh, I see here purchase amount, which is correct. But the sales amount, which is a measure that is in sales, uh, is not affected here because we don't have a filter that traverses uh, this relationship. And if you look at the, at the model, we don't have a way to connect these two tables because we don't have a key. And even though we had a key, it would make any sense. Now, technically, we could create this relationship through the product name, through the many-to-many -many relationship, but this can create other problems the moment we include the date because the, 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 the filter over the date will not be transferred the right way. So don't do that. This is a bad idea. Don't do that. If I do, just show you. If I do, I have some number here, but believe me, if you sum these numbers, at the end of the day, you will see that uh, you have, now for the brand, no, but if I use the brand and uh, the uh, date, for example, so let's use here the year, and let's use the year in the column cell, so let's do this. I show you the problem. Come on. Okay, so at this point, uh, you should notice that there is something strange because uh, the total of the sales for three years is uh, this number, which is the sum of the three years. But when you look at each year, you probably will analyze, we see that there is something strange in the numbers we're getting for the sales amount, especially for the sales amount, All right? Sorry, for the sales amount is very visible that the total for three years is 30 million. And for 2019, 28 million, it doesn't make any sense. So the right thing to do in this case is having uh, 
the date table and uh, the product table. And uh, how can I get the product table? Again, the right thing to do is to prepare this uh, with Power Query. Because we don't have time to refresh the entire model. I can do this in DAX, even though it's not the, you know, the ideal solution. But uh, if I need to do something quick and dirty, I can uh, use uh, this approach. So I can create a calculated table in this case using a, a DAX expression, which retrieves the unique values of uh, product names uh, uh, from the two tables, sales and purchases, I remove the duplicates, uh, and I have my tables product here. Now that I have my table product, I can connect product uh, uh, by using the product name here and here. And what I have now is, this is a one fact table, this is another fact, fact table, I have a, a shared date table here, okay? And this is what allows me to do the analysis I want. So if I go back here and I use, uh, instead of the brand uh, here, I use the brand from the product, uh, what I get is I have a brand that filters both purchases and sales amount. And if I do the same for the date, I would have something that works also for the dates. So what we did is, uh, this is another common scenario. We have different fact tables. What we have to do, we have to create the shared dimensions that we can connect to the fact tables so that we make it easy to analyze uh, data and measure from different fact tables. You can also create a single chart that compares the data, the data present in two different fact tables that would be impossible otherwise without using uh, uh, very, very strange techniques and slow techniques in DAX to do that. So um, what I've shown you is using DAX, but actually the right thing to do is doing this before logging data in Power BI. You can do this in SQL. You can use this in Power Query. DAX is your last resort. I don't suggest you to use DAX to do data transformation. This is not the right thing to do. And uh, this is the code I used in the example. As I said, it was just a quick and dirty solution to provide you uh, the final example uh, in, a, in an easy way. So conclusion, and then we uh, move forward. So data modeling is a required skill for Power BI. Um, you learn data model potentially before learning DAX because if you have a good data model, you don't need complex DAX. And uh, don't be just a data consumer, be a data modeler, and uh, this way you will get the better results with Power BI. Okay, I hope, uh, I don't know if there are questions, but you don't have, we don't have time now. Probably we have, uh, thank you very much, guys, uh, and uh, uh, see you next time. Uh, and now it's time for the next speaker to, to be prepared. Okay, you can stop the record now.